Remember who you are. A young son facing a crossroads of life. He lacks the courage and strength to make the choice he knows he needs to make. His father died in a, in a tragic accident when he was young, leaving a gaping hole in his life. The tragedy thrust him to, to wander from his responsibility to a life free from worry. But he was aimless and confused until a friend helped remind him of the words of his father. Remember who you are. You are my son and the one true king. Those simple yet powerful words would help transform a carefree, no worry son to take his rightful place as king. Remember who you are. I was 14 years old when I saw the climactic scene unfold on the big screen, the 30-year-old classic, The Lion King. The young Simba loses his father and it thrusts and his, loses his stability. It was not until Rafiki, the baboon, led him to the mystical vision of his father in the sky. Remember who you are. Simba returns home with Nala to fight his uncle Scar and take his place as king. Now Simba had forgotten who he was and he had forgotten where he had came from. He needed the words from Mufasa, his father. Remember who you are. You are my son, the one true king. Like Mufasa 30 years ago, the Apostle Paul wants the church in Rome to remember who they are. Except he does not want to, them to remember their royal heritage, but he wants them to know how they were outside of the royal line. They were commoners. They were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, Ephesians 2. They were a wild olive shoot, not part of the tree, and they needed to be grafted into that royal family to become sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with the one true king. That They needed to remember who they were before God saved them so that they would not become boastful and arrogant. Uh, my, my sermon today, I, I pray, would help re remind us, help us remember who we are so that we would not become arrogant and boastful. It's important to, to remember the context of the cultural, uh, the cultural context of the church at Rome. Uh, Jewish believers uh, founded the church and were leaders until Claudius, the emperor, kind of made, it, made an edict that all Jews had to, to leave Rome, probably around 49 AD. Uh, the edict lasted about five years right before Claudius' death. Uh, that's when the Jewish believers who left Rome had returned. While they left, the Gentiles became the dominant group in the church. So as the Jewish believers started to return to Rome, there arose some, some conflict in the church between these two groups. So Paul writes to Rome to unfold God's plan of salvation for both Jews and Gentiles. Before we dive into the text this morning, I want to note how many times Paul references Jews and Gentiles, or Jews and Greeks, in the same sentence in this book of Romans. So if you want to just hold your place here, turn back to chapter 1. We'll go through a few places here. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In the next chapter, chapter 2, 9 through 11. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Next chapter of chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. We have all charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. Jump down to verse 21. But now the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned, Jew and Gentile, and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now look in 29 and 30, the same chapter. Is God the God of the Jews only, or is not the God? Is he not God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one, 
since you will, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Now jump to chapter 9, Romans chapter 9. Verses 22 through 24. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. Chapter 10, verses 12 through 12 and 13. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I'm simply trying to show at the start of this exposition how central this thought was in Paul's mind. In Romans 9 through 11, he is addressing God's plan of salvation for both the Jews and the Gentiles. And as he does, he's making applications to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Our three paragraphs today are primarily addressing the Gentiles. And Paul wants the Gentiles to remember and then respond. So there's first, there's two things that Paul wants the Gentiles to remember. The first, remember the plan. Remember the plan. Uh, Paul starts with reminding the Gentiles of God's plan to, re re to redeem both them, the Gentiles, and Israel. It, it's never meant to be an either-or, but always a both-end. Look back with me in Romans chapter 11, verses 11 and 12. Paul writes, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So why has Israel stumbled? They have stumbled for a season in order that the Gentiles might be brought in, and so that the Israel might be aroused to jealousy to repent and believe in Jesus Christ as as Lord. Israel hardened their heart against God and experienced a divine retribution. Uh, before uh, Paul gives the two commands to the Gentiles, as we've already heard, he first reminds them of his plan to save Israel. Uh, the next section of Scripture will give more details on the future of Israel, so that's a topic that you'd love to, to learn more about. Come back next week. But before we go there, Paul has to really summarize what he's already said. Look at verses 11 and 12 again. So he says, So I ask, did they, jump, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. When he, when he begins with that, that question, did Israel stumble so they would utterly fall? You could add the word utterly there. That's what he's, what he's trying to draw out. Not that they would just stumble for a short season and then come back. No, he's like, did they stumble so they would fall away from grace utterly or indefinitely? Uh, Paul is addressing the, the previous verses about the hardening of Israel's heart. He raises that question. Is there any hope for Israel? Will they fall away indefinitely? In typical Pauline fashion, he, he gives his emphatic answer. By no means. God still has a plan for Israel. There is still hope for their restoration. But then he clarifies. He says in verse 12, rather... Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Israel was hardened so that the Gentiles could be saved. And since the Gentiles will be saved, Israel will be jealous for what the Gentiles have. And then they will believe. Israel had often disdained, despised the Gentiles. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations, a light to the Gentiles. But instead of shining God's glory to the nations, they live with darkened eyes. And we looked at that last week in Romans 11, 8 through 10. Now, the Gentiles have experienced the promises of the new covenant. So in Romans chapter 6, verses 17, God's word says, But thanks be to God, 
that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standing of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. That, that, that language being obedient from the heart is really throwing back language of Jeremiah 31. So in Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, now if you were a, a, a believer, uh, if you were a follower of Yahweh, you would have known these verses. These are verses that are like our John 3.16. If you grew up in church in any number period of time, you're going to know that verse. Well, if you grew up as a follower of Yahweh, a believer in the coming Messiah, you would have known Jeremiah 31. So Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one say to his neighbor and each to his brother saying, know the Lord, for they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The Gentiles receive the gospel just like the Jews. They have become recipients of that promise. So if we go back to Acts chapter 10, we see the, the Gentiles uh, responded to the preaching of, of Peter and believed. So Peter went back to, to Jerusalem and he reported to the, the Jewish council what happened. And this is what he says in Acts 11, 15 through 18. There's going to be a lots of times I'm going to be referencing other scriptures today. We're not going to have time to go to look at each one. Just write it down and look at it later if you want to. So Acts 11, 15 through 18. Peter says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, the Gentiles, just as on us at the beginning. The beginning in, in Acts chapter 2, the Pentecost. And I remember what the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them, the Gentiles, as he gave to us, the Jews, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has grant, granted repentance that leads to life. Salvation came to the Gentiles in the same way it came to the Jews. God has granted repentance that leads to eternal life to the Gentiles and to the Jews. So, why am I spending all this time going over this? Well, in this section of Scripture in particular, Romans 9 through 11, we have to be very careful as we work through this section. There are times in the New Testament, the, the language that the biblical authors use of Israel are often used very similar of the church. And yet there are other times when the church and Israel are distinct. So where are they similar? Galatians 6, 15 and 16. It says, For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. For as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. He's speaking to the church and calls them the Israel of God. Uh, the apostle uh, James uh, opens his letter to the church this way a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. That's a language referring to Israel, yet he's speaking to the church. Peter does the same thing in his first epistle. He says to those who are of the elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and for obedience to Jesus Christ and the for sprinkling of, with his blood. So he talks to the, to the elect exiles of the dispersion, referencing the Jews, and yet he's speaking to the church. Later in the same book, Peter ca calls the church language specifically used of Israel in the Old Testament. So in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, But you were a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So there are other sections of Scripture that speak of Israel and the church as distinct. 
want from one another. And this is the passage we come to today, Romans chapter 11. So as we go through this section, we have to be sure to understand who is Paul referring to if we're going to get the interpretation right. Let me just say this. I've studied lots of commentaries on these sections, and um, Romans 9 through 11 is not an easy section to teach and to preach because when you read one commentator, they say, we think it means this. You read another and it says, we think it means this. Well, I, I like you. I've read your stuff before and I've really agreed with you. I, I've liked you and really read your stuff before and I've agreed with you, but you're both saying different things. And that happens a lot in these chapters. So I'm going to tell you what I think the text is saying. You're welcome. I am not going to give you opinions on every single other option that you could think through in, in, this, in this way. Now, there are a few things when you, when you teach as a pastor that rouse up lots of emotion within people. Sometimes it's eschatology of when Christ is going to return and how the end, end happens with the rapture and whatnot. Israel is one of those things. So preaching this, this passage, there's going to be some, some of you who, who have maybe even studied this or thought about this a lot more than I have. I'm happy to talk with you if you think I've said anything that is contrary to the text of of Scripture. That's my caveat. You're welcome. Israel, in verse 11, is most likely, I believe, referring to ethnic Israel, the ethnic Israel who have darkened their eyes and stumbled from the truth. Uh, Paul is saying that ethnic Israel will be aroused to jealousy when they see the Gentiles walking and living by the Spirit. Now, now remember in this section, he, has, he, he talks about Israel in two ways. Chapter 9, verse 6, he says, not all Israel is Israel, but those are Israel by promise. So there's ethnic Israel, and then there's Israel of those of the promise. Then there's Gentiles. Those are really the three groups that you see in Romans 9 through 11. But he says, this is God's plan to save ethnic Israel along with the Gentiles. Paul shifts his argument from the lesser to the greater. He's speaking to the Gentiles here. We see that in, in, in verse 13. He wants them to see how much they have benefited from, their, from the disobedience of Israel to make them look forward to how much more they will be benefited by Israel's obedience. So I believe both conditions, conditional statements in verse 12, is referring to one thing. I think it's a, it's a parallelism. Look at verse 12. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Israel's trespass and failure meant riches for the Gentiles and opened up salvation outside of Israel. When it says the world and it says Gentiles, I think Paul is saying the same thing twice. So I don't think that he's saying two separate things here. I think he's saying the same thing and, and saying the same thing as, as repetition so we get it. And then look at the end of that, that sentence in verse 12. How much more will their full inclusion mean? Notice the exclamation point. This is Paul getting a little excited while he's, while he's writing it. If, if you got that, then when they sinned, can you imagine how much more you're going to get when they follow God from their heart? By the power of the Spirit? Like Paul just wants them to be excited as they wait for the, the engrafting of Israel back into the, to the olive tree. It's almost as if Paul takes a deep breath and says the same thing with a slightly different emphasis to make sure they get it. Now, this often happens to me as a preacher. You're, you're preaching the Word of God and then you get kind of carried away and you say lots of things and then you're kind of like, okay, slow it down. You take a breath, and then you almost say the same thing over again to make sure that you heard it. It happens to me all the time. I think this is what Paul is doing in Romans 11, 13 through 16. It says in verse 13, Now, I am speaking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch then as I'm apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Why? In order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, 
so are the branches. So so Paul wants people to see the fruit of his preaching so that some Jews would believe and repent and believe. We saw this all throughout the book of Acts. When Paul preached, oftentimes it would say, many Gentiles believed and some Jews. That tended to be the the, the track record as Paul went through on his journeys. He would would go to the synagogues, some Jews would believe, but there would be a large number of Gentiles who would would come and hear the word of Christ Christ. And repent. So I believe verse 15, life from the dead, I think he's referring to to the end time resurrection of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Now he could be referring to a spiritual resurrection, just the the gospel. We know that when we repent of our sins and trust in Christ, God says that we move from from death to life. We have been transformed. We we see this in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. It says that we are raised up with him in the heavenlies. Meaning that when you give your life to Jesus Christ right now, in God's eyes, you have been resurrected. It's a foregone conclusion. That could be what he, what he refers to here. But it could also mean this, this future picture of at the end of days when ethnic Israel will respond in, in faith to the Messiah, a large of them will move from, from death to life. They'll be, they'll be resurrected at the end of, end of days. I think it's most likely that it's referring to the end of history here. We're going to see why that's important as we look next week, 25 through 36. Either way, Paul continues to encourage the Gentiles to remember God's plan of salvation, bringing their minds back to look at the patriarchs. Look at verse 16. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Again, one of the challenges of studying this, this passage is that there's going to be people who think that Paul is speaking about two different things here. The dough is different than the root. It could mean this. It could mean that. A lot of it's speculation. Again, good rules of interpretation. You always interpret Scripture with Scripture. You interpret the more clear passages with the more obscure passages. So when I say here, I believe, I, I, I could say, I, I think, I'm making an educated guess. Are you following me? So don't get mad if you don't agree with me. Code. I believe what Paul is doing here is he's using a parallelism again, in, in, like he did in verse 12. The dough and the root are both referring to the patriarchs. If God called and set apart Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they are holy, those who are called to join in the same promise of the Messiah are also holy. So therefore, is the root holy? The tree is holy, and so are the branches. Now, the call of of Abraham in Genesis 12 is God's plan, not just to bless the Jews, but also to bless all the families of the earth, including the Gentiles, the world. So in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So through the promised seed, God will bless all the families of the earth through Abraham and through his offspring. If the root is holy, the patriarchs, the promise, so are the branches. So, point number one. That's right, we're only at point number one. Uh, what was point number one? Remember the plan. Remember the plan, okay? Second point, remember your past. Two things to remember. Remember the plan of God and remember your past. So we've already saw in verse 13, who is Paul speaking to? He says, I'm speaking to the Gentiles inasmuch as I am the, the apostle of the Gentiles. He's speaking to the Gentiles, reminding them of God's promises to Israel. Now, he's already done this in Romans. He did the beginning of chapter 3. He did it again at the, at the beginning of chapter 9. This has been a consistent argument in the book. Why? Was, well, you'll notice why Paul's doing it here in this section. He, he's laying out God's plan for salvation for all the families of the earth, including Israel. But before he does, after he does that, he wants them to shift back to remember their past. Look at verses 17 and 18. But if some of the branches were broken off... And you, Gentiles, although a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others, 
and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Paul is teaching the same plan of salvation. He just changes the analogy and makes one specific application with it. There is one olive tree with one root that has branches on the tree. The branches are individual people of ethnic Israel. Paul refers to some of the branches, or Israelites, were broken off because of disbelief. Maybe a way... uh, uh, a passage of scripture that might help you understand some of this is Hebrews chapter 3 and 4. That same language is the people who saw the great promises of God in the, uh, in the Exodus. And they, were, they, were, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years and they said they did not enter the promised land because of disbelief. So that some of these Jews were, were cut off because they did not believe in the promise of the coming Messiah. The wild, wild olive shoot is the Gentiles, who were, who were not natural, they were not ethnic Israel, but they were grafted into the same tree. They now share in the same nourishing root of that tree. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus for all believers, Jew and Gentile, for there is no distinction in Christ. Galatians 3, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free. There is no male nor female. There is, we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. In Christ, there is no boasting of, for, for we all have, we are all one in him. Jesus Christ gets all the glory. Now you can imagine a, a church full of, of Jewish believers and full of Gentiles believers who are, who are, who are at odds with one another, who are, who are disagreeing and trying to, to puff up their heritage. Look at us because we are ethnic Israel in our heritage. Look at us because we have been grafted into the vine as wild olive shoots. This tension was going back and forth. And Paul rebukes the Jews in chapter 2, and now he's rebuking the Gentiles in chapter 11. He has to speak to both of them if the church is going to be a holy community. These Gentile Christians were looking down upon the Jews. They were boasting in their new privileged place in God's plan of redemption, forgetting their past. Verse 18, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Why would you exalt yourself over Israel? You are unnatural, sinful, rebellious. Then God grafted you in. You did not make the tree holy. The tree made you holy. The promise of Abraham, which is offered to all who trust in Christ, is what makes you holy. It's what makes you and I holy. The promise as seen in fulfillment of in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gentiles needed to remember who they were and what they deserved before God called them. Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Church, this is who you were. This is who the Gentiles were. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh, using our hands and our feet, not to serve God, but to serve ourselves, to serve our desire, to serve the wicked desires of our own flesh. And we were by nature children of wrath, meaning that we deserve to be condemned for our sin, for our treason against our creator king. Beloved, we cannot forget our past. We must always remember who we were before we met Christ. You know, one of the things I love about uh, the Apostle Paul and his letters is he never got over his salvation. He, He never got over how sinful he was before he met Christ. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, he's speaking to his young son in the faith, and he just goes on a little mini rant about his past. He says, I thank God who has given me strength in Christ Jesus our Lord because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Though formerly, I was a blasphemer, 
persecutor, an insolent opponent. He, he, was, he was the one who stood before a crowd of people who picked up stones to, to hail them at Stephen. Seeing this young Christian die before his very eyes, and he stood above them, and people laid down their cloaks at his feet afterward. I was an enemy of God. That's what Paul is saying. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and, grace, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ overflowed for me through the faith and love that is in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the foremost. We must remember where we were so that we can praise him of what we have now become in Christ. It is not because of our works of righteousness, but because of his mercy. That's what Romans chapter 1 through chapter 11 is all about. When we forget our past, we tend to elevate ourselves over others. We tend to think that we are better than them. You know, a few uh, years ago, we had summer interns here and at the beginning of the summer, we, we went out to do evangelism, and uh, one of them came up to me afterward and said, you know, this was the first time in my life I went out to, to share my faith and do evangelism with people I didn't know. Fast forward six weeks, we're towards the end of the summer, we were hosting a mission team that, that came uh, to visit, and we were doing evangelism with them, and uh, that, that same intern came to me and said, can you believe that these people have never gone out before to share their faith? Dude, that was you six weeks ago, right? <laughs> Chill. But how quick are we to forget? How, how quick are we to forget our past? Listen, if you are here and you're not a believer in Jesus, I wonder what your experience is with Christians. Have you felt judged by them? Have you felt that Christians acted more holier than now? and look down on you? Sadly, I have heard that's too often the case. We never want to forget what God has done to save us and what he has saved us from. As I read above, everyone without Jesus Christ as Lord are dead in their trespasses and sin and under God's wrath. So if you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible says that you are in trouble. And not just in a little bit of trouble, but a whole lot of serious trouble. You have done sinful things. You have lied, you have lusted, you have coveted, and you have manipulated others. We know that you have because we know that we have. Friend, think about your life and your sin. And then think about dying. Think about meeting God. Does that thought terrify you? If it does, it just is a reminder that you know you're a sinner and you need a Savior. I don't know all the situations going on in, in your life, but I know what God wants you to do. I know what God wants us all to do. He wants us to, point number three, respond to your pride. Respond to your pride. He wants none of us to be arrogant, none of us to look down on those who don't think or act like us. He wants us to remember our past and to respond to our pride. Look at verses 18 and following. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the, sever the kindness and the severity of God. Severity to those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, you will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, 
how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? There's two imperatives in the section. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. Do not become proud, but fear. Whenever we see pride in our lives, we must repent of it. The Gentiles in Rome were looking down upon the Jews for their disbelief. And Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, don't be arrogant. Don't be proud. One of my favorite scriptures is 1 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, what do you have that you do not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Now, we may not be looking down upon Jews in our congregation, but we may be looking down upon others. Now, Paul is addressing disunity and conflict in the body of Christ. He's, he lays the foundation of God's redemption plan from, from the patriarchs to show them that there is no boasting of themselves over others in the body of Christ. There is no boasting of themselves over those who are yet to trust in Christ. Let's make this practical for us today. Let me just ask you a series of questions. Do you ever look down upon others in the body of Christ? Do you ever say in your heart, why can't they get it together? Why do they keep struggling with that? Is it that hard to get to church? They don't even get to Sunday school. What's wrong with them? Can you believe that? Are we quick to judge and elevate ourselves over others? Or are we quick to pray for those? Do we think of ourselves more highly than we ought? Do non-Christians in your life think that you judge them? Do you act as if you are better than them? because God and his gracious mercy opened your eyes so that you could accept Christ and God hasn't done that with them yet? Do you puff yourself up thinking that in some way you're better than those who have yet to follow Christ? Do our individual lives and do our, does our communal life together as a church arouse people to jealousy of what we have? Not, not in a negative way of jealousy, but in a sanctifying, pleasing aroma that would draw people to Christ. When people walk into our, our, our body here on, on a Sunday, do they, do they smell that, that sweet aroma of, of grandma's you know, ch freshly baked chocolate chip cookies? Or do they smell the, the trash before pickup day? Are we drawing people in because of our community? Or are we repelling them from it? You know, by God's grace, I hear more often that, and, than not that our community is drawing people in. How encouraging and welcoming our congregation is but we still have room to grow. We have to fight against cliques. We have to fight against only inviting those to our tables that are in the same stage of life or who are our friends. We have to work to protect our unity and our joy. We have to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. It's a simple question. What is the one thing, what is the one thing that you can do to make our community more compelling for Christ? Here's the challenge of a preacher. I know that Tuesday, you will probably not remember what I say. So I spend 12 to 15 hours every week laboring over these words that you can just forget them. But I know right now you're being nourished, you're being fed, you're being encouraged to follow after Jesus. But I don't want you to think when you leave this place, I want you to be changed. What's one thing, one thing that you can do in this body that can make our community more compelling? Maybe it's to repent right? Maybe. Well, we'll give you a testimony in, in, in a moment. Um, okay. Okay. You know, we, we have to think about what we, what we can do to help draw people to Christ. You know, this past week I was, uh, I was in Scotland at a, at a conference and, you know, I was just meeting lots of different people from all over the world. Uh, it, was, it was a great privilege and, you know, everyone you know, got to know people and they'd say, well, tell me about your church. And I got a chance to just tell about my church. What God has done since, since I arrived in, in 2012, how he has changed our church, that, 
that we were kind of on, maybe on the, on the lower end of growth and now to see God doing many great works that's flourishing in terms of uh, sending out missionaries and raising up pastor elders and seeing love among the body, a hunger for the word of God. And the thing I keep on telling people is of late, the church has just been so receptive to the word of God. It's been so encouraging to my heart. It's great. God is doing a wonderful work in our church. And I pray that God will continue to do a wonderful work in our church, even as we think about sending out Jay and Kristen to Portugal and sending out Grant and Maria back to Virginia, that we would continue to be a hub church, a resourcing church. Even today, sending you know, Grant, sending a team of 20 to, to serve a church in South, to South Durham. How every single week, some church in our area calls us and says, hey, can you send us a preacher because we need a, a break or we don't have anyone to fill the pulpit. I praise God for that. But here's my fear. I, I, I pray that we would not become arrogant and that we would not become boastful. That is not who we want to be. Everything that God has done in our congregation has been done by his grace, has done by his mercy. It is not because of us. We cannot lift ourselves up over other churches or other ministries. We have to thank God for what he's doing in our church and rejoice. Rejoice what he's done. And if we have pride in our heart, if we think that we're better than others in our body and outside of our body, we must repent. We must respond to our pride and be laid low. Just as we move towards a close, look, it says, it says, take note of the kindness and severity of God. So if you are a Christian or you are a non-Christian, we both must do what Romans 11, 22, and 23 say. Note then the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their disbelief, will be grafted, and for God has the power to graft them in again. The kindness and the severity of God is seen in the cross of Jesus Christ. It shows the severity of God and how seriously God takes sin. If you reject God, you will face his wrath. The cross is a prime example of, of the severity of God. Jesus took the cross, taking God's wrath to pay the penalty for sin. There is no other way. God's justice had to rain down upon the substitute, on the sacrificial lamb. But the cross is also where we see the kindness of God because Jesus was the one hanging on the cross as our sacrificial lamb. The eternal son born of a baby in Bethlehem, raised as a man in Nazareth, made like us in every respect so that he could take the wrath of God for our sake. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Because he loved us, he died in our place. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. The cross is a perfect display of the kindness and severity of God. God's severity is shown to all who reject him. He cut off the natural branches when they rejected the Messiah. Do not think that he would not cut you off if you do the same. There is only one tree, only one way of salvation, one root that makes us holy. We're only standing fast through faith. If you reject Jesus, you will fall. He has offered you kindness, but if you reject him, you will receive his severity. God shows no partiality to the Jew or the Gentile. Does your pride think you don't need him? Do you think your good works will be enough for you on judgment day? That you have done enough to justify yourself before a holy God? Note the severity and the kindness of God. God is kind to everyone who calls upon the name of Jesus. If you believe in Jesus Christ, God's kindness is directed to you. He shows no partiality. He will save everyone, everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, the Jew and to the Greek. If you believe God sent Jesus Christ, you will be shown kindness in salvation, male or female, raised in the church or raised outside the church. His kindness is given to all who come to him. Remember who you were so that you can remember who you are. And when you do, we will respond to our pride with humility. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 
Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, nor any other unrighteous act will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says these words, and such were, were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Remember who you were, unrighteous, outside the kingdom of God, and remember who you now are, righteous, a child of the promise, washed, sanctified, justified in and only in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. There is only one tree of salvation. Because of your faith in Christ, because of what he did on your behalf, you can be grafted and experience his kindness forever. See, friends, when we behold that tree, we see the kindness and the severity of God. Only in the cross we can remember who we were and we can rejoice in who we are and in whom we belong. Father, we thank you that you tell us to remember your plan. We thank you that you have helped us remember of where we were and who you are in Christ. I pray, God, that you would not let us as a people be arrogant and proud of our accomplishments, but I pray that we would respond to our pride with fear that we would take note of the severity and the kindness of God. I pray that we would behold the cross and that we would remember of who we are in you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the best things to do after you hear the word of God